What lurks behind this unassuming storefront in Cleveland, Ohio? It's the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. So, uh, <laughs> welcome back to the Buckland Museum Frankenstein Radio Control Room, broadcasting out of a secret uh, cavern below Lake Erie, where we perform our sacred rites. My name is Stephen Intermill, and I operate the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic with my wife, Jillian, and in partnership with our dear friend, Tony Rotunda. Today, we will be speaking with Professor Nicholas Kingsley, who we met last year. Nicholas is described as the provost of the Gray School of Wizardry. Um, he, uh, he was here on a quest. He had dropped something off, and then he was going to the new physical location of the Gray School. But we're going to learn all about that here in a bit. Thanks for everybody that's tuned in tomorrow, or no, um, Friday, we'll be talking to Reverend Tim Shaw, and we're going to talk about his uh, Strange Arcane collection. On um, Monday, I think we're going to be speaking with Clint Marsh, who is the, uh, uh, he runs the Fiddler's Green Zine. And then Wednesday, it's going to be Heather Green, who uh, wrote a great book about witchcraft in the film. So that is stuff to look forward to, but we are here in the here and now. And welcome, Professor King. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So virtually. Yeah, you know, it's uh, you were here in the physical location. That was great. And uh, we hope to have you back out here some other day. But now we have to do it virtual, right? So you uh, are the Wizard Kingsley. And one thing that people have been saying, like, see you. They'll come in here and they'll ask me and uh, they'll ask, uh, you know, Kara, kind of our resident house witch, she met her, and they'll say things like, what is a wizard? And um, I'll be like, well, you know, like, but I, I think you might have a better description. I might. Uh, I mean, yours works well, and I think that it covers a lot of bases in that uh, wizardry is a, it's a vague art of many things, but... Really, wizardry boils down to three rules that the wizard follows and then the underpinning philosophy of service. And so this, this is a philosophical pursuit that one sort of engages in and partakes of. And uh, it doesn't tie into the place that religion might serve in someone's life. So we see people of all different uh, walks of life, of creeds, of different religions also be wizards and apply the philosophical sort of pursuits of wizardry uh, to their daily lives. And so in this way, uh, it's really, really quite magical. Um, boiling it right down to it, wizards are servants of the communities that they're a part of. So your sound was breaking up a bit, but it was uh, essentially servants of the community that you're a part of. And what were the other two? Uh, well, I'm sorry, the sound broke up. That's no good. But uh, the the real crux of wizardry comes down to three rules that a wizard follows. And these rules are that uh, you always take responsibility for your actions and credit for your deeds. The second rule is that reputation is power. And the third rule is that with great responsibility comes great power. And with great power comes great responsibility. And so these are the three rules of wizardry. And then these are all sort of guided by a philosophy of service. Uh, and this is to the communities that we're a part of. Awesome. Excellent. So, uh, you know, I got to ask, uh, did you always know that you were a wizard growing up? Or is this something that was just kind of like unfolded before you, you know? Like, well, did somebody call you one day? Yes. Uh, so I've been a, a wizard since I was about 10 years old. My previous career hope was the train conductor. And so if things fall out here on Wizardry, I, I still have that as a backup. Uh, but my grandfather introduced me to the Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, and uh, things just went from there. So I've been 
uh, a wizard now, uh, you know, for 14, 15 years to most of my life. <laughs> so, um, I guess I should probably talk about the first time we met, the first and only time. It was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I tell this story a lot to our visitors because I love showing Pathfinder. Uh, Oberon yeah. Bell, the famous wizard, was here over the summer and we're hanging around, having a good time. And I could tell he's kind of checking us out, making sure that he was honoring his friend Ray's legacy. The last time he'd seen this collection, I think it was 1971, and it was in Ray's basement in Long Island. So here he was checking things out. And uh, I guess we passed the test because you show up in uh, like late September, early October. And um, even here you stood out a bit because, you know, you've got uh, Oberon's staff. You have a long robe. And uh, you came in. You're pretty much like, I'm here on a quest to present you yes. Finder. Oberon's Verendum is magical staff. And now it has a really beautiful place of honor on top of our case that is our uh, tools of witchcraft and artifacts of the craft. So that was a um, that was a fun day. That was Kara's first day with us. And I just remember she was wow. like, well, I guess this is kind of stuff that you expect to happen here at the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft yeah. and Magic. <laughs> yeah. So so that was a really fun day. But where were you going to? Where were you? Uh, where were you heading? So we uh, that was an interesting quest, and uh, it started in interesting ways. Often quests do, but initially we were to to trek out to Texas, and that's where we were going to settle things down. But that all fell through, and uh, I found this property out here in New York, and fell in love with it. It's got nine acres of hilltop property, which we used for the uh, Gray School's conclave grounds. So when we have our yearly conclave, we now have a physical spot in the world to congregate to gather to do that. This year we may see what happens. I mean, that's up in the air right now, but uh, in the future, certainly. And uh, so we were heading your way with the staff of Zell, of course, and we took that um, and dropped it off. I met our my dear friend, um, Frederick Servio, who's a, a member of the Gray School's administrative council. We had some very interesting, uh, I think it's uh, some some sort of South African food perhaps across the street from the... Uh, they are no longer with us. It is now a oh. bar shenanigans with a Z. And uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> it was right? quite good. Oh. Yeah, I, I know. It was uh, one of my favorite restaurants in Cleveland. But you know, all things must pass, right? That's, I suppose so. Well, so I was happy enough to have enjoyed that then. Uh, we got back in the car. My staff broke, of all things, which is a shame, the one that you have in the banner. Although it broke, you know, it, it, it was a, of a different era. So that's okay. Sometimes that happens. And, yeah, I know the uh, video where you were making a new one. So Yes, well, and that's a process. That'll, that'll take time. I'm not too happy with the one I have at present. You got it. It's a thing that takes, you know, sorting out until you find the right one. But uh, we we arrived here in Whitehall, uh, New York, and set up uh, sort of our new home base and um, are preparing the conclave grounds. I go up there just about three or four times a week to build and uh, get things ready. So hopefully, if things uh, blow over, they may. You know, it's always good to hope by summer. Then um, we will have our conclave this year. But if you know. If not, the next year will certainly be one uh, to, to not miss. So, you know, we kind of dodged around the subject a bit, um, but you're there for something called the Gray School. And can you kind of mm -hmm. tell us a bit about what that is? Uh, sure. So the Gray School is a, the Gray School of Wizardry is a secular institution of, of arcane learnings. Uh, this is from stuff into the beast mastery realm, into the dark arts, into life ways, which is sort of uh, beast mastery for people. Uh, it, it covers these occult and, and esoteric knowledges that are often left out by mundane school. Uh, this is, of course, the occult and magic and spell work and what magic is and how it works and where it functions and the rules of these sorts of things. Um, as, as much as it is, 
ancient history and the lore of lost peoples and different languages, um, right into Lifeways, which is deep and interesting, you know, philosophical things about the way in which we interact and build. Uh, one of the wizard's great powers is their ability to craft and shape community. And this is really a, a skill honed in the Lifeways department. Um, so Grace School really seeks to uh, train wizards in that uh, when you join the Grace School, you, you adopt a, the title of apprentice, that you are apprenticing into the craft and trade of wizardry in the same way one might uh, do that in, in days of yore as an apprentice uh, craftsman or apprentice forge you know, or something like this, apprentice blacksmiths. Uh, these are people who are now walking the path of wizardry and learning about what that means and what role that has in the world today. Um, oftentimes, I think we're presented in today's sort of monoculture of, of heroism and, and you know the dark side of the force, so to speak. And we've gone away from that in some respects, but the light side of the force, if, you will, if I can stretch the metaphor here, is vast and full of shades. And so we want to say that the good guy doesn't just have to look like the traditional hero. There's a lot of different roles that we can all fill in life. And one of them is wizardry. And for those who feel that calling, uh, our doors are open. Very cool. Um, so how long is the grade school? How long have you been involved? I've been involved for about two and three fourths years, <laughs> almost three years. Oh, wow. Uh, as a faculty member. And then I enrolled uh, briefly enrolled in 2012 or 13, maybe even 14, and sort of flirted with the online classes for a bit. Um, a lot of a lot of the wizardry that I went through in life was uh, taking the grimoire for the apprentice wizard and living and being out there in the world and doing stuff with that and you know going to places and and leading groups and uh, those sorts of things. So I took my apprenticeship into the world with that book as sort of my lessons. Um, so since, I mean, in that sense, you know, I suppose since I was 10, just so quite a while. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, the Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard and uh, yes. written by this gentleman right here. Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, we brought up earlier Oberon Zell. And you were, uh, you know what? I have another fun picture of Oberon with our uh, partner in the museum, Tony, here. Oh, and, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two great people right there. Um, yeah. They, uh, so you were Oberon's apprentice? I am. So, I am actively his apprentice, yes. So you are still Oberon's apprentice. So that's um, yes. once an apprentice, always an apprentice. Well, but, so my apprenticeship with Oberon is that uh, it's a learning thing for me. I've learned wizardry from the book. I went through life. I did that. you know. But I have a different sort of aspirational goal, right? I think we all should have aspirations and uh, things we want to achieve in life. And so I wanted to really study wizardry at the deepest most intricate level and uh you know i reached out to oberon after they already having been faculty at the gray school i've been working there for a little while and uh you know i said i would i'd really like to apprentice under you here so that i can learn really what it means to be a wizard in the full sense of this and that i can embody these sorts of things to help our school better so i can further kind of direct and, and channel energy and, and these sorts of things and so, uh, you know, an apprenticeship with Oberon Zell, I'll tell you, it's a transformative experience. That's what it is. It's a transformative experience. And uh, some people, I think, when they look at apprenticeship, uh, you kind of have two different sorts of people who look at it as, I will be provided lessons and you'll teach me, or lessons will arrive through my being with you and you will learn from those. And that second one is really true apprenticeship. You engage and you live around that kind of sense and, and you uh, embody those different things that come up and you deal with them. And by dealing with them, you learn lessons and you evolve. Uh, the apprenticeship is an opportunity to greater knowledge. But to take that knowledge, you still have to employ your own agency and do. 
Uh, the first example is just teaching. That's just regular old classes and teaching as it is. So, you know, an apprenticeship is a, is a personal engagement where you really try to uh, extract and distill the essence of your mentor into, you know, this will be the new chord added to the song that I sing. You know, this is the, the new piece that I'm going to lay into my own track. I think where uh, some people certainly go awry with apprenticeship is that they seek to emulate to such a degree that they become clones. And one of the great pitfalls of anyone seeking to make a name for themselves in the world in any sense is uh, mimicking someone else and trying to copy what someone else does instead of learn from it and adapt that and then kind of give your own flavor of it back. Um, you know, was, no one wants a copy of the original. We had the original, you know, no one's going, oh, well, that Nicholas Kingsley, I, I sure hope he's exactly like Oberon. No one wants that. You know, we have Oberon. And you should enjoy and appreciate and, and really revel in the wizardry that he brings. And so yeah. as I apprenticed with him, uh, I learned a lot about what it means to be a wizard and how to kind of engage with things. But it's my great honor to be his apprentice, to bear that title. Uh, it comes with responsibilities, of course. Um, but uh, it's happily one I, I bear. I have a certificate somewhere around here, but I think it's upstairs in my office. So there you go. That, that sounds amazing. So um, mm -hmm. I saw, I believe it was on your Instagram the other day where you're like, hey, it's time for, uh, for us to get an apprentice here at the uh at the gray school um so this would be your apprentice here Somebody yeah so uh, well and so an apprentice with me too and that's you know the house is my house i'll just say that you know i don't want anyone to think the house is the school but the grounds behind the house are used for the school okay yeah uh, but uh you know an apprentice here yeah i am looking for a new one you know there's a lot of work that i do um, and just because I'm learning myself, which I think we should always learn when we seek. It's sort of these things that I think it's um, in my class, Wizardry 100, in the Gray School of Wizardry. So, you know, if you're looking at this, if you're watching this, and you're thinking about wizardry and this kind of stuff, it's uh, $20 to enroll for a month. So, you know, try it out and see what you think about it. $20? Um, yeah, $20. That sounds like a no brainer. So, yeah, well, you know, cool. <laughs> yeah. so people the, uh, can roll at the uh, what is it, the Gray School of Wizardry.com? They can go to www.grayschool.com. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that'll take them to the right place. It redirects somewhere right now because we're, we're building new website bits. But uh, it will take them to the right place and all that is functional. And then there's a button that says enroll now. Um, but, you know, with Wizardry, with the, the Wizardry 100, you know, that's a really important class. And people have asked me, you know, what do you get out of being an apprentice with you, specifically the Wizard Kingsley, versus going through uh, the Gray School? And, you know, the honest answer is I have more time to dedicate to someone who is in my life around me, you know, all the time. Uh, that could be we're going up for a hike through the grounds and I'm going to give a little talk or a lecture where you may play a game of chess and talk about things, or, you know, you'll be sent out on a quest to go get flour and eggs from the store. <laughs> There's all sorts of perks to that. Um, you know, and that, that personal connection, I think, is still the best way to learn. Uh, that being said, I really think that, the, that it is a very close second being able to take our classes and engage, especially with our virtual campus, which is very popular right now, considering the world is closed. Uh, so they, they have been engaging on Second Life, which the school has a Second Life sim that people can uh, do virtual conclaves on. Our apprentice leadership's been doing a great job with that. But um, yeah, no, so for apprentices here at the house, I mean, it's it's an experience. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting and be very in depth. I say in the advert that, you know, not everyone's gonna enjoy every second of it because wizardry is hard. Now, life is hard. And sometimes the lessons that come are hard, but I do think that it will be pleasant on the whole. It'll be transformative in a positive way. And, uh, you know, you'll definitely learn how to play chess by the end of it. So that, that's, <laughs> that's well, the perfect. People need to have a firmer understanding of chess. So that's cool. We've got some comments from our uh, friends. Joe, uh, he says, the website's cool. We're looking at it now. 500 courses. Oh. Um, let's yeah. see. 
Dead Girls saying twenty dollars. That's a new brainer. Um, and uh, Kara says thank you for the clarification, Nicholas. Ari, the manor versus the gray school. I was wondering. And then Laura Houston from Ohio. She says greetings. Um, blessed be. Oh, and of course Wendy uh, Muir is saying hello from Canada. And Elias, our tarot reader. I don't think you met him. He was, uh, I think he was on vacation when you came by. Oh, you know? man. But he uh, says he can't wait for the Gray School Express. A little bit of a uh, yes. comment there about your previous gig. So. <laughs> the train uh, is merging worlds. You know, <laughs> that's what that is. Elias oh, has always got like a good zinger. Um, yeah. So let's see. How's the garden growing? You've been spending ah. some time there, right? Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, hashtag wizards, um, <laughs> it's going well. It's, it's been fun. Wizards I, uh, of Instagram? Yeah, wizards of Instagram. It's super hip. We're, we're very fly. <laughs> uh, it was a laundry yard when the house was built, and the walls were all crumbly down, and Arthur and I took a look at it and said, you know, I think we can do something with that. So we set up. The first wall, it snowed, so that hindered any further progress. And then uh, I, it's been a slow progress, but today we built a compost uh, stone wall kind of enclosure to put the compost in. And, uh, you know, if we're, if we're not careful here, I may get chickens soon, too. So, you know, it's no oh, cool. <laughs> life on the front here. So it's good stuff. Yeah, but I've been that, enjoying it. I think it's lovely to be, able to be outside right now. You know, uh, I try to do live streams of it. I've got friends in New York City and stuff who just are trapped in their house. They can't oh, yeah. go out and do anything. Yeah, uh, so I was like, yeah. oh, well, come outside with me virtually. Yeah, I have a lot of friends in New York and I own um, New York City. And uh, yeah, I, you know, like just yeah. best positive vibes I can send to them because it's, uh, it's really, I mean, get, they don't have cars. Are you going to get in a subway right now? Oh, oh. I know. Yeah. That's, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. But, you know, that's the crazy thing about it. I just, ah, it's something else. You know, and this is one, one of those moments that it, it allows for uh, truly extraordinary people to be extraordinary. I think that, you know, many people have taken this catastrophe in different ways and they've, you know, made different points about it. it's good for the earth, it's this and that, you know. Uh, I take a very human-centric view as a wizard, communities and whatnot, and I think that it provides, uh, this is the Herculean task, this is the quest before us that many people now have. Uh, you know, we all, I think, let me clarify, I think that some people are born heroes, but they get kind of put into place in life that they maybe do, you know, they're a sandwich artist at Subway or they they work a job nine to five and they don't really feel like they're fulfilling that whole sense of their heroism, you know, embracing their fate or uh, taking hold of their destiny, perhaps even more apt. And this, any, any moment of crisis really allows these people to take that step forward and embody these great aspects that they have inside. And we've seen so much of that you know, so many people who are, who you just, and this isn't to be cruel or mean or disrespectful, but, you know, in, in the general scope of things, one does not look at the Walmart greeter as heroic. That's not how you think of it. Not ungood or not uh, unappreciated, certainly, but it's not something one considers heroic. And in times where there is a definite danger, where there is harm to being out, to persist through that, for not only pay and goodwill towards oneself, but for the betterment of others, and with that as, an, as a genuine inspira uh, inspiration, I think that's heroic. I think that's beautiful. I think that there's something genuinely magical about, about people right now who are standing and going, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be out here on the line for you, and I'm going to do my bit, you know, whether that's grocery stores or, or doctors or whatever they may be. I just yeah. think it's... You know, it's high quality. That's good citizen citizenship. That's good stuff. It's yeah. It's, it's a uh, piece of something more. One of our regulars here, uh, Iliad, 
is a uh, he works for a local grocer and uh you know i i get a bit choked up when i think about him i think about our friend sandy who uh she she uh works in the pharmaceutical industry and uh you know i think about the stuff that they're doing right now mm-hmm. and uh, uh you know just kind of stuff that are trying to keep the wheels on the machine here and i really um i don't know i appreciate all of them i mean i appreciate everybody but like right now it's uh well, you know, they get yeah. their moment in the spotlight. You know, this is their time. That one person. Yeah. Goes, well, why didn't you appreciate me? I I appreciate you, guy who didn't get appreciated. But yeah, you know, they're really doing a great job. They're stepping up in a way that it makes me proud. You know, and there's really a good. genuine. Yeah, there's connection with people I've never met before. I went to Walmart last night to get some water or something like that. water and uh, some sun chips, which I enjoy. And uh, she's out there with extra masks for people and, you know, the whole nine yards. And I thought, you know, that's high quality. That's high quality yeah. humanity, right? You're doing it right. You know, good for yeah. them. Good for Yeah, them. it's nice to see people step up right now. Um, so I wanted to ask you a bit about a wizard's tools, all right? Because here, you know, like at the Buckle Museum of Witchcraft, and magic, of course, we talk about you know like things like the affame and the chalice mm-hmm. and you know different tools of witchcraft. But what are some tools of wizardry? Mm. Mm. A well, pipe, um, <laughs> you know, like would be a pipe a tool. I mean, definitely like the random, right? The staff that's such an important part yeah. of it. It depends what you're doing. <laughs> You know, in spell work, I think in digging into kind of what, how a wizard approaches certain things. Um, yeah, you know, it is a part of it, having a staff. And I think having a hat, um, it, it lets people know what you do. You know, the king wears a crown and uh, the doctor wears the doctor's hat and the, and the post office person has the post officer hat. You know, there's hats to tell people what you do. So I think... I think the wizard's hat's important, and the staff is a certain. That's that's mysteries, you know. I can't talk about mysteries. <laughs> right. It has yeah. all the purpose, um, which is sacred unto the path of the wizard in in its sort of totemic understanding. Right. You understand that way. Um, past that, I think a willingness to be around people, at least some of the time, is very important. Um, and also a willingness to share. And these are not tools which one I think associates with with work often, but it is. It's very important that um, you know you mentioned a pipe, and the reason why a wizard carries a pipe is so you can smoke with someone because it's easier to talk with someone when you're smoking than when it's not like having a drink. Um, and these are little tools that you use to kind of engage another person in deeper conversation, or really kind of ingratiate yourself into their good good graces uh and these are powerful ways of magic you know this very soft kind of reordering of a social fear around you for a moment with a good oh i'm sorry would you like a pipe <laughs> and you know, maybe you share a, a puff or two of that of that fine long bottom stuff probably the not for next year or so but yeah i imagine but, that's something that you would be doing um so, you <laughs> so you're involved with wizardry. Can you ever, you know, like, but you had talked about, like, you know, the mysteries and whatnot. But can you share maybe, like, um, maybe an early memory of magic actually being something where you're like, oh, yeah, this, this is magic right here? Well, I've always believed in magic but I don't believe in things that I can't see. That's right. a very skeptical magician. Uh, and so I have to jump back a ways, a way ways. My grandfather, Dirty Pagan, which is the best kind. Uh, my father, not a pagan, 
So there's a bit of a generational gap in, in understanding, but you know, early camping trips with, with grandpa up on the mountain, understanding that the trees are alive and the ground is alive, and the plants are alive, and this sort of thing is an energy in a way that you don't understand energy. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. Think of it like a circuit, you know, it's connected without being as connected, you know, physically. I thought, all right, well, crazy old man in the woods, that's good. So I took that, I tucked that away. And as I got older, we explored kind of more about these things that were more for the apprentice wizard, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, an understanding of magic became more apparent and developed into an understanding of the world. And I think people take magic and they separate it from the world. They say, well, this is this and this is this. Magic can break the laws of physics and, and undo this or that. And it's not been my experience. Um, I do teach class on the foundation. No, no but it's not been my experience. I find that uh the laws of magic the rules if you wish uh which are not rules in so much a moral or ethical sense but in the same way that the rules of gravity are rules you know they function and that these magical rules don't supersede or break physical rules but they do add on to them and so you know i've worked a lot in probability enhancement and shifting things towards manifestation and um you know, for a while I was really into, into like sort of singing my will to be, so you kind of uh, stream of consciousness, chant a song into creation, and you tie that into a spell, and off it goes. Um, so the first big, I know your question was the first act of magic that I was like, oh, that's magic. Uh, my first voiceover job. I, voiceover job. Yeah, I used to be a voice actor in another life. Really? Um, yeah, right. in this life. Different, yeah. So I um, was doing this voiceover application job, and the game that I was doing it for didn't didn't actually want to hire any voice actors. They they weren't keen on it. They're like, well, we think the game's all right without any voices in it, you know. And there's arrow commands and whatnot. And I thought. Ah, you know, I'm I'm going to sit down tonight and I'm going to use what I know about correspondences and resonance and these kind of things. I don't know, maybe I was 16 or so. Uh, yeah, about 16. And I put these things together and I just really, really embodied that idea and held it there. And then I lit my candles and I did my spell and I sent it off. And... You know, there was an effect, in, and I know what kind of model this magic is now, but we have to take the class for that. Um, <laughs> the, the effect of that was that I did get this voiceover job, and they were like, you know, actually, we've been thinking about your arguments that you made, and they were pretty good arguments, and so, uh, yeah, let's give it a go. And they hired on three other voice actors, and we, we had a good time with it. It was a very successful game. Um, the Can you tell us? Can you tell no, us? Yeah, that was histories uh <laughs> it was a good game though and uh, yeah but uh, i i have to remain professional you know i can't have people going around playing my video games but the the, the crux of it is, is that the magic didn't make that happen but it didn't move the probability for it i'd already made good arguments and so i put this as that thing which really tips the edge over and it's like that last penny on those penny games in the arcade uh if i'm not you know, people still go to arcades. The they kind of create an avalanche when you get just the right penny in just the right spot, and all the pennies spill into a trough. It's I think like that in where we can tip the probability towards things. Um, this is one model of magic. Of course, there are others that I don't use as often, but I think that was a big one for sure. Um, my first exorcism I witnessed that was a pretty big one too. I thought that was very uh, potent. It was very powerful. So you're gonna um, take that oh, a bit, right? Well, yeah, you know, always good. Uh, equally, though, I think this is also where I really had, and this is maybe only a year later. You know, a lot of this learning is very condensed when that's all you do. So the the um, the following year, I met a guy who had just lost his mind. You know, this bonkers. And he lost his mind by studying the occult so much that he lost any sort of real connection back to the world around him. It's a phenomenon which I've turned uh, mage burn, and it, it persists throughout uh, my colleagues' east of it too. But 
the the concept is that somebody kind of delves so deeply past what is mundane or what is kind of perceived to be normal, so to speak, that they can't touch back anymore. And I thought, all right, well, if there's knowledge that does that to you, right? If there's things you can learn that sort of shift you in such a way, then I think there's some seriousness to it. That's there's always a consequence, right? There's an equal and opposite reaction. So if the positive action is the acquisition of knowledge and the ability to do these things, then is there a downside? And this is kind of where I started looking into um, this mage burn concept and people who sort of fall off the wagon, I suppose, in a sense, they just can't differentiate at a point between uh, what's real and what's what's not and it's it's something else but it is uh it is definitely a thing so i think all those things combined you know they help and then constant reminders right life as it goes is continually good riding the synchronicity wave and so to speak so um yeah i think magic's always been a part of my life and um just like grown in my understanding and my application of it as i've Grown. Hopefully, by the time I'm old and gray, I can just summon things out of the air. But you know, we're, we're working on it. Right. I. You know. It's. Uh, that's. <laughs> yeah. So, um, where do you see the gray school going in the next couple of years? Like, mm. what's the? Uh, I've seen some pictures on your social media where you're like, "What? There's a castle." You know, is there, uh, are you planning a physical, like, large yeah. scale? Yes. If the children the plan. Yeah, well, so the plan right now is to acquire the castle. And the castle is like $430,000 or something like that. So it's not cheap. It's not chump change. But for a castle, that's not bad. Um. Once that's gotten, then all sorts of other things can be done. Planning in, in the sense that, you know, if somebody wants to walk up someday and be like, hey, I, I happen to have $430,000. Here's that. That'd be nice. Um, yeah. but we're looking at goals. You know, we're looking at fundraisers. We're looking at doing things to get the down payment to do stuff. So uh, when we have that, the, the kind of plan would be that we would have weekly not weekly, but a week long workshop that we'd offer to apprentices, um, different modules that you could enroll in to kind of gain different certificates. Uh, so we, we have a partnership with the Grey Wardens, which is a group off the Grey Council, which is a group of mages and sages. I think it's about 56 elders of different pagan communities and things like this. Um, and so we have a partnership with the Grey Wardens that um, we might be able to kind of work out a module where you go for a week, you stay at the castle, you learn about defense against the dark arts magic, you engage in ceremonial magic, you sort of understand these things. And this is, uh, you know, maybe worth a level of study at grade school so that you really get ahead in your studies and a link forward in application to join the wardens after you graduate. So that's a thing. Um, past that, you know, hosting major conclaves for the magical community uh, is a huge thing. I'm an academic, so <laughs> I. I love to discuss this sort of stuff, philosopher by trade. So I'd like to have uh, conventions where we're able to call, you know, different members of different uh, magical schools and talk about uh, leading theories and the innovations that science has made to kind of border on the arcane and, uh, you know, advance the field of magic and the understanding of what we're doing with these things. I think it's incredibly important to explore this realm uh, of reality and having a place where we could do that um you know come together across the different traditions and things like this uh, which is what grade school is all about anyway so having that physical location be great for that um, right you know so the cap so nicholas i uh or professor kingsley um do you, have, do you have any advice for anyone um I don't know, maybe struggling a bit right now during the lockdown. Any kind of wizardly advice? I kind of feel like, I mean, I think I could use some. Well, you know, one of the things, a few points. Uh, you're not alone right now in the lockdown. You're watching us here 
on this show. And though, you know, we're not in person with you, uh, we are here. We're still connected by this great internet that uh, wraps around the world and keeps us knowing each other. Yeah, I think that's More important. Work. It is, it is. And there's also that I think right now is a great opportunity to get to know ourselves a little bit as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of thinking that a lot of people are doing right now. They're examining their lives. They're kind of contemplating where they are and what's led them to where they are. And I think that's positive. A word of warning, though, is that you don't, you know, dwell on the negatives right now. And you really celebrate the things that make you unique and, and uh, a powerful piece of the world. You know, it's a network that we build together, a community. And that means all the members are important. So, you know, reach out to people, call people, write letters, write a journal. That's a good one. And, uh, you know, maybe start a garden. And if you don't have a yard that you've got a sink, fill that up with dirt. No one will mind. <laughs> You can go for it. Yeah, I um, I think those are good points that you have there. Um, well, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us here in the uh, Buckland Museum in Exile. Um, you know, like I said, I was broadcasting out of a uh, cavern deep below Lake yeah. Erie, um, <laughs> but uh, been spending a lot of time making improvements for the museum, trying to create a better experience for our guests and. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I'd love to share it, but you know, I'm also not like, Hey, let's open tomorrow. It's uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Um, but thank yeah. you so much for coming in. I uh, wanted to talk to you again. Cause I was like, who is this mysterious wizard that came in here? And uh, <laughs> so it's been kind of fun to catch up and find out exactly where you're going and what you've been up to. Um, I'm gonna uh, say goodbye to our uh, guests, but if you wanna hold on just a second and uh, so I can give you a proper goodbye. Um, let's see here, back here. All right, thanks for everybody tuning in. I um, Let's see, like I said, we have uh, Timothy Shaw, Tim Shaw, the uh, Reverend, he's gonna be here. On Friday, then uh, we're going to have uh, the publisher of Fiddler's Green here on Monday and then Heather Green on Wednesday. Uh, last couple days have been kind of intense around here. And uh, Alex LaFontaine, wait, he is a real wizard? Yes, he's a real wizard. Um, and you could be too if you visit the uh, Gray School of Wizardry. Uh Anyway, things have been kind of intense around here, but really looking forward to, uh, I don't know, seeing what tomorrow brings. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Nicholas, um, you can find him, or Professor Kingsley, as I should say. If you want to see what we're up to, visit our Facebook, our Instagram, uh, or visit bucklandmuseum.org. Thank you. Bye-bye. I love you. <laughs>